One of the other important changes that happens at the end of the Pleistocene is this continuing trend of increased survivorship, this demographic change in a decrease in adult mortality. So work by Kaspari and Lee has suggested that if you look at the dentition of Pleistocene hominins, so for example, if you look at basically what stage of dental eruption individuals are at at the time of death, this is ER 1813, a homo habilis from the beginning of the Pleistocene, and you can see that its third molars are just erupting. So this is an individual that died as probably a late teenager. By the end of the Pleistocene, and here's a specimen from Herto in Ethiopia, one of the earliest anatomically modern Homo sapiens we have. And if we see its dentition, you can see that in, it's actually worn all of its teeth fairly heavily. So all of its teeth are in, first molar, second molar, third molar, but the third molar is heavily worn, meaning it's been there for a while. So this suggests that this one is an older adult individual. And if we look at that ratio of older adult individuals to younger adult individuals, like 1813, we can see that as we move throughout the Pleistocene, by the time we hit Neanderthals, we begin seeing an expansion in the ratio of old adults relative to young adults. By the time we hit anatomically modern Homo sapiens, we see a huge expansion in the ratio of old adults to young adults. In other words, more individuals that reach adulthood are reaching older adulthood. So the rate of mortality for younger adults has decreased significantly. This demographic change is hugely important for how we think about evolutionary processes, particularly in the late Pleistocene. Now you recall from the very beginning of the semester, I introduced you to some basic aspects of demography. And one of the things I showed you was a mortality curve. This is a curve that basically illustrates the probability of death at any point in life. So if we look at humans today, Whereas the highest rates of mortality are in very young individuals, so basically newborns, and the early few years of life. Then it decreases significantly and remains basically very low, with maybe a slight uptick in males around the age of reproductive maturation, but remains relatively low until we reach later adulthood when we suddenly see a big expansion in mortality. So this is a very U-shaped distribution in terms of mortality, where we die young and we die old, and for the most part, in the middle of our life, the only major cause of death is accidental. Now, if we look at the Pleistocene, we would expect it perhaps much greater childhood mortality, perhaps extending for a longer period of time. There's some evidence that there was a greater rate of mortality associated with maturation, that transition into adulthood, perhaps associated with the movement of individuals from one population to another in the same way that chimpanzees do, for example. But that as we go at the beginning of the Pleistocene, it's a much earlier rate of adult mortality. That attrition associated with adults happens much earlier and maybe even is differently shaped. And maybe that sort of more continuously upward linear process as opposed to this sort of rapid U shape. So that breadth of the shape of that U might have been much broader. But at some point in the Pleistocene, and again, this is something that we see mainly happening at the end of the middle of Pleistocene and into the late Pleistocene, we see a big expansion in adult survivorship. We suddenly see more individuals who are young adults making it to the age of old adults. So this is gonna have big consequences for the overall structure of populations. Now it's also possible that at the same time, we're seeing some reduction in juvenile and childhood mortality, so the ratio at which young individuals are surviving. If old individuals are doing a better job of surviving, it's possible also that they're doing a better job of keeping young individuals alive. This might mean you have more individuals reaching adulthood and more individuals reaching older adulthood. The net effect of this is that suddenly you're gonna have expansion in population size. The overall size of populations is gonna be much larger because more people are surviving. This is gonna put pressure then on actually the amount of resources populations need to extract out of their environment to survive. That notion of ecological intensification that we've talked about before. But it's also gonna change the structure of a population. Suddenly you're gonna have more older individuals hanging around. More older individuals who might even be grandparents. Individuals who have survived long enough to have children and to see their children have children. And this sets up the possibility of transmission of information, transmission of knowledge across multiple generations, not just from parent to offspring, not just that kind of passive learning, for example, that we see in apes, where we have mothers in very close contact with their infants, or even the kind of active learning that might have developed in the Pleistocene, where we had individuals instructing their children, but individuals conveying information not just to their children, but to their grandchildren. 
And this has importance not just because grandchildren can sometimes help raise those kids, maybe do a better job of keeping those kids alive by keeping them away from predators while the parents are out collecting food, but they also can convey information across a longer range of time. If you have suddenly grandparents alive, instead of having 20 or 25 years of active knowledge as an adult, basically your lived experiences as an adult in the Pleistocene, suddenly you might have 40 or 50 years of lived experience. So your ability to understand regular year-to-year -year changes in the environment, the distribution of prey, the presence of food items, suddenly becomes much broader. So again, as a population, your ability to survive suddenly becomes greater. So a pattern of increasing longevity in the Pleistocene, a reduction in adult mortality, perhaps a reduction in childhood mortality, would have huge demographic consequences. Populations are larger, populations are more dense, and populations are structured differently in terms of the age distribution. We've got suddenly old adults, even grandparents, hanging around. This is fundamentally important for how we think about evolution acting specifically in the context of humans. This is one of those cases where human evolution and how evolutionary processes are acting might be unique. But again, this combination of relying on our brain as a fundamental aspect of the human evolutionary niche, the brain which is tremendously powerful but flexible in the way that it allows us to behaviorally adjust to environmental problems, coupled with an expanding demographic portfolio, one in which individuals are living longer, becoming in contact with more individuals across larger age ranges, sets up a fundamentally fascinating evolutionary dynamic. One of those instances where human evolution might be particularly different and unique to look at in terms of how evolutionary processes work. It sets up a process where you have tremendous capabilities to get cultural feedback, ratcheting elements where cultural change can lead to additional cultural change. And recall that cultural change Cultural processes as evolutionary force, unlike natural selective processes, can be fundamentally directed. They can be directed at specific problems, which can again accelerate the ability of evolution to shape populations to specific population needs. So it's an important component in thinking about how evolution works in humans specifically in the late Pleistocene.